What's up again everybody, some big Crucible of War announcements were made recently so let's get into it. So here on the website, on the FabTCG website, you can find this article, in fact I'll show you exactly how I got to it. Here's the uh, main web page, and if you scroll down just past the, uh, the big scroll bar left to right, you've got these articles right here, okay? This one is literally just a picture. I'll click it for you just to just to show you. It's literally just a picture with this line of text that says the preview season will run from August 12th to 27th with a release date of August 28th. So they're doing the release, uh, the pre-release season just like they did with uh, Arcane Rising as well. And we get this sweet looking artwork and we have no clue who these people are except do we? We actually have a little bit of clues uh, based on a couple of factors that I was looking through. Now, um, I... When I first saw this, I thought to myself, oh, maybe these are like similar to the like the ninja class. They're from the same region like Mysteria, but I think that's wrong. I think they're actually not. I think they're from Volcor. And I think they're from Volcor because uh, all this lava area around us here makes a ton of sense to uh, for them to be in Volcor. Now, maybe they're like coming from a different region to fight in Volcor. That could possibly be it because it's obviously the set is called Crucible of War, so that's a possibility, but I don't think so. The other reason I think that they're probably from uh, Volcor is because of the similarity in their resemblance to Kano the hero. Um, yes, they do have like similar swords to some of the cards that we see uh, represented in Mysteria in the Ninja class. Okay, they've got katana blades. Just because they have the same weapon as uh, other characters that we've seen in Mysteria doesn't mean that uh, they can't be from Volcor as well. In fact, if you look at Kano's artwork, uh, the outfit that he's wearing, his robes are very um, Japanese or Chinese, very Asian inspired. So we could we could conceivably see that these could be um, some of the armies that they talk about on the lore page, which you can find, by the way, if you go up to Heroes, here at the top and you go down to World of Wrath, you can see all of these articles. They've blocked out these four, which is very mysterious to me. I'm not sure why they did that, but you can read about Volcor and Metrics and the Pits and the Demonastery here, but you can't click on the Demonastery, which is also very strange. Um, so I'm not sure what that's about, but if you go to Volcor, they talk about, I'll show you exactly where, they talk about the military prowess right here, about how um, there's just constant wars going on. Uh, within the uh, area. I even tried looking at this wildlife thing and there is no wildlife here that match the uh, creatures that we see here quite uh, exactly. But nevertheless, I think these are members of Volcor, like one of the one of the armies of Volcor. And I'm interested to see because they use this, uh, if we go all the way back to the very front page, they use that artwork on both of the article front headers. So I'm wondering if that's uh, super, super important to the to the set itself, to the, maybe the storyline of the set. Anyway, that's all <laughs> that's all of that to say. That's like the intro because here's where all of the info is. The info is uh, fast and furious in this article, so let's go through it. Um, obviously, this is just talking about when the uh, set debuts, August 28th, but and it's also talking about that this is the Crucible of War set. It has some really cool imagery right here, um, but they changed some things. First of all, and this is a great change. I love this change. They changed how they display the rarity icons. Okay, In previous sets, you had to look down here and you literally just had to see what letter it was. Okay, They didn't have any marking whatsoever, any color coding, nothing. It was literally just... C R S M L and I I've never pulled a fabled so I'm gonna guess they had an F I think it was an F, um, but now they have gray for common, blue for rare, red for mythic, L and uh, an orange for legendary, and then a diamond for a fabled card. I'm assuming that's fabled. I'm assuming. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what it looks like to me. Now, um, di diving in more onto this, you start to notice, ah, they're missing the super rare slot. And yes, they are missing the super rare slot. We'll talk about that down here when we get to the super rare section. Also looking at this, um, we're seeing some token item stuff. Uh, I literally looked up the art, uh, the artists, excuse me. I looked up the artists for all of these, particularly for this one, and I'll talk about why in a moment. But I've looked up the artists, and the artists are... Uh, they have some pretty cool work that you can find on like ArtStation or on their Instagram pages, so you should check out the different artists. But I'm gonna focus in real quick right here on this one. This is a four intellect, 20 health, what we can only assume to be a hero, which is really strange because this is being displayed on the legendary slot 
in this picture. Now, I, there's a couple of ways to explain this. Way number one, this could literally just be a stock photo that they had someone in the art team make. Like Legend Story Studios said, hey, we wanna slap together like something on this rarity icon section. Can you just throw together some random cards and just slap them up there, right? They could have done that. So this could literally not represent any of the cards that we might see. We might not see, a, for some reason, like a common generic token item, I don't know. I'm just saying that. We might not see a mythic six attack, three defense card. Um, we might not see a four intellect, 20 health legendary hero. And I'm, I am very much, unless, unless I'm like jumping too far ahead of myself, I'm very much hoping that we don't, okay? And we'll talk about that here in a moment. But this is, it, it could be that. It could be that they just made a mock-up and this is like not accurate information for what we will find in the set. It could mean that we do have a legendary hero and um, that they would be introducing a new hero with this supplementary set, which I think is, in a general sense, I think is really cool. Now, whether or not they're putting it in the legendary slot, that is the sticking point for me. Uh, and again, we'll talk about that as we scroll down, but it's possible that they do that. Now, it's also possible that they pulled all of this info from a card that exists um, in the set, and then they just slap the L down there, just to, I don't know, maybe it's, it's like a like a faint. They, they told you one thing, and then they went the other way. Maybe that's it, right? I don't know. Nevertheless, they now have these little icons, so that's pretty cool. Now, the next thing that they're uh, talking about in the article is one that I find very important to understand. So, super rares. You may have noticed the absence of the super rare icon above, as we talked about a moment ago. They have cut super rares as a rarity. Now, in general, I think this is amazing. I think there were too many rarities in the game, too many like various rarity slots to fill in when you're creating cards. And personally, I think getting rid of one, if you're gonna get rid of one of them, it might as well be the super rare slot because uh, I think you can definitely more easily create card uh, types or just take the, the ideas that you had for all of the cards, including the super rare ideas, and just more evenly spread them out amongst um, a variety of rarities, right? And what they've done to compensate for that, as you'll see here, is they have upped the number of Majestics to 36, okay? So beforehand, we would get two Majestics per box. So you'd open up a box, you'd get like two Majestics, plus or minus, right, a couple. And you would get like four, plus or minus a couple, right? Super rares. But now, if you open up a box, and this is going onward as well, if you open up a box, you're gonna get somewhere in the ballpark of six Majestics. And you're gonna get zero Super Rares, obviously, because they cut Super Rares. Now, what does this remind me of? It reminds me of, well, obviously Magic the Gathering does something very similar to this with regards to distribution in their boxes. But it also reminds me of uh, Star Wars Destiny, if you ever played it and purchased that game. They, they did similar pricing or similar, um, uh, structuring of the of the way they dealt out their uh, higher rarity cards and this reminds me a lot of that I honestly I very much prefer this structure as you can see here there's gonna be one fabled card in the entire set which is consistent to what we've seen there's only two legendaries because this is a smaller set and they've decided they're only gonna make two legendary cards and that is a, a nice little head scratcher it makes you think okay well previous to this point the four legendaries that you could get in the box, or was it five? I can't even remember. The legendaries you would get in the box were class specific, okay? So you would um, you would have a class and you would get a single legendary for that. So it was like the the bracers for the, the warrior, you get the picture, right? The mask for the um, ninja. But now there's only two legendaries. So that leads me back to this point. If we get a legendary hero, we can assume that not every class is going to get a legendary hero, which makes me also think, is there such a thing as a classless hero in this game? And there certainly could be, okay, certainly could be. Or there, it also leads me to believe, okay, is there a hero within this that um, is only related to one class? Or maybe there's some sort of like a multi-class hero that if you choose to play this hero, all of a sudden you have access to both card pools for both of those classes. And I think that is something that uh, we'll see, maybe not in this set, but I think that's one of those sort of obvious next steps for how the game could progress. Now, here's my main issue with that. If they put something like that, if they put something like that onto a legendary spot, okay, and there's only two legendaries in the set, and legendaries are 
incredibly tricky to get, in fact, they actually just straight up talk about it here in a moment, we're gonna talk about it, then you're basically pricing just about everybody except whales, AKA people that buy a ton of boxes, which are probably a lot of people that watch these videos. You're pricing out anybody that's a little bit more casual completely from playing that multi-class hero or playing that hero um, that is part of a class that, you know, maybe people want to play or a classless hero, right? You're pricing those people out because they either have to go and buy that card on the secondary market, which is going to drive the price crazy high because demand uh, is high and, and uh, supply is low, or they're going to have to crack box after box after box, just hoping to get that legendary hero, okay? So that's what really worries me most about seeing this slot right here, is I don't want people to be priced out of the game when the game is so fresh and so new and so good, right? We want people playing the game, okay? But maybe that's not the case, maybe that's not what they're going for, um, and I do think there is something to be said about really exciting legendary pulls. And same thing with Majestics. I think it's, it's important to have exciting Majestic pulls, which is, again, why I think it's cool to cut the super rare slot because all of a sudden that super rare uh, slot is is absorbed by something that might be even more exciting in the form of a majestic. Okay, now the next part is interesting. Uh, and I'm going to kind of read this verbatim. When designing Flesh and Blood, we play, pay a lot of attention to the frequency of each individual high rarity card. By this, we mean that we don't look at a legendary as being a 1 in 96 pack pull, but rather as a Fangdahl Spring Tunic appears in 1 in 480 packs. This was planned so that the Welcome to Wrath and Arcane Rising both had five legendary equipment, meaning that you'd get on average one legendary equipment per case. Okay, so there you go. Um, it's our intention for the core booster sets like uh, Welcome to Wrath and Arcane Rising and the next one, which they've codenamed Monarch, to most mostly follow this model. Okay, so it says that their core booster packs are going to follow that at least the next one is going to follow that model. Now, for supplementary sets, which is what Crucible of War is, a smaller set that is meant to help bolster previous classes, perhaps is what they're referring to as supplementary set, the model is different. Because there's only two legendary cards in the set, they appear approximately one out of every 240 packs, meaning that the frequency of finding a specific legendary is consistent with the established baseline. So what this is essentially is saying is that if they're trying to keep the drop rate for any specific legendary the same as one in 480 packs, in order to do that for two legendaries, you're basically just looking at if you wanted to get any legendary, it didn't matter if you wanted legendary number one or legendary number two, then you're gonna look at uh, investing maximum uh, 240 packs worth to find one of those two legendaries. Ba basically, they took the one in 480 drop rate, you put it in half because there's two possible options that you could get. So you gotta open 240 packs maximum to get a legendary. So what does that mean box-wise? Well, you'd have to pay like $800. You'd have to buy like 10 boxes if you were so unlucky that you had to actually meet that like maximum drop rate. Now. That's okay if the legendaries are like fun, but not like super meta-defining impactful. Like for example, the legendaries from previous sets, all being class specific, all being equipment, were like very highly sought after because they were all so powerful and they all did things that made the deck fundamentally work on a competitive level. If these cards are not like that, it may be just fine that it's more rare to find a legendary per box than it was in, in previous sets. If these are like fun, exciting, cool cards that um, may not necessarily see a ton of competitive play, that's probably fine. But if these are heroes or like one ofs that you're never gonna find in other rarity slots, things like that, then that starts to make me think, hmm, is that a great, idea for <laughs> for growing your game and that's kind of what i talked about with regards to uh the possibility of having a legendary hero from earlier all of this to say i have trusted that uh legend story studios this whole time to make a good game uh, after getting into it when it released and they've delivered on every <laughs> on in every form and fashion so i feel like uh they've earned the trust going forward until uh they prove otherwise and so far they haven't so i'm looking forward to seeing what they have in store with regards to the two legendaries in this set and seeing how the power levels and how the tuning of those cards um, compares to full-on sets versus this one, which is a supplemental set. The next and the last thing that we're going to talk about is short prints. I saw some people that were uh, worried about this as well, and I'm not so sure. I don't know yet how I feel about it, but 
short prints. Okay, as much as possible, we try to make the frequency of each card within the rarity the same or as close to the same as possible. A lot of planning goes into trying to achieve this with consideration of constraints of manufacturing. Now, this is important, such as the fixed number of card slots on a print sheet. When you print a bunch of cards, you have a big old sheet of paper or whatever material they use, it's cardboard. You have a big old, big old sheet of it and you can fit X number of cards on it and then they can print that X number of times, right? You can have two sheets, three sheets for a set and you just print all of those like you know, 20 times and then all of a sudden you have 20 copies of that set, right? Um, and then how many different print sheets can coexist, okay? So they talk about it right there. Now, if, and then and they go on, I should just keep reading. In special circumstances, we will intentionally short print cards. And what that means is that instead of taking this and printing the same number of all 36 Majestics, they're going to change the frequency and the amount that they print of certain Majestics. So let's say, for example, it's a really popular Majestic that a lot of people are going to want because it's got a high power level. Well, maybe they print more of those so that the people that want to actually get their hands on those and play them have more of an opportunity to play those, okay? Let's also say, for example, that they um, have Majestic that has a lower power level and they realize, yeah, this is gonna be a fun card to play with and try to make work, make work, because the power level is lower. So let's print a little bit less of those because less people are gonna wanna play them. They could also flip-flop those. They could say, this card's really, really gonna be sought after, let's print less of those. This card's really gonna be trash, let's print more of those. They could do it that way too. The way they talk about it is like this though. This is mostly relevant when a play set of a card is less than three. For example, equipment and cards with legendary keyword that only allow you to have one in the deck are cards players typically wanna own only one copy of, right? So if you're printing, like for example in the past, a legendary equipment, and then you also had like a legendary playable card in your deck that you could three of. In general, you would need to print more of the three ofs so more people can have three ofs of it in their deck. Whereas if you only are ever going to wear one piece of legendary equipment on your, you know, in your deck slot variant, whatever you want to call it, they don't need to print as many of those cards because you're not running three of. That's essentially what they're saying here. And it makes a ton of sense. Why would they print um, majestics that put a tag, because they could do this, they could put a tag on certain majestics that say you can only run two copies of this. Why would they print like the same number of those as a majestic that you can put three copies of? It doesn't make as much sense, especially if you're trying to be economical and put fit everything onto a print sheet in such a way that you can get the most copies of that printed at the cheapest cost. So it makes some sense to short print certain cards, right? That's essentially what they're saying. There are many majestic equipments in Crucible of War. Ah, that's a, like a on the nose, straight up what we can expect. There's tons of majestic equipments in Crucible of War, as, a, as well as a very special card, Gorganian Tome, which has the keyword legendary, which is interesting. It says that has the keyword legendary. It didn't say that it was a legendary rarity card which means they're willing to print the word legendary, like I was just talking about, onto cards that aren't legendary. So Gorganian Tome, which does not sound like a piece of equipment, sounds like something you'd put in your deck, Tome, um, has legendary on it. You can only put one of them in your deck. Why would you print that card to the same amount as you'd print a card that would have three of. To balance supply and demand for these cards, they have been intentionally short printed, appearing sli slightly less than half as often as other Majestics in Crucible of War. I think that's a good idea. I think that's smart from a business perspective. I think that's smart looking at the, um, the necessary things that your players need to play the game. I think that's the right thing you should generally do as long as it's done with that mentality in mind. So good on you, Legend Story Studios for putting it that way and saying it out there and, and being transparent. I think that's the biggest thing is being transparent because you could just as easily not even reveal any of that information and uh, just go about your daily life collecting your uh, checks that we're gonna pay you when we buy all of your stuff. And yet they chose to uh, say that to everybody so that when everyone cracks these boxes open and if people start crunching numbers and going, hey, this one has appeared only half as many times, people don't go, you suck and all of a sudden they have this thing on their hand. They're just gonna be transparent with it, and that is very smart. So good on you, Legend Story Studios. So what do you think about the announcement? What is your opinion on the whole set in and of itself? What do you think about the game going forward based on this information? Let me know in a comment below, and as always, thanks for watching.